Hello, hi, good evening. So welcome back to our journey of story of life on earth. And this is Krishna Veni. I'm really grateful for all those who have joined me on this lecture. So thank you, thank you once again. So today we are going to talk about a new chapter for class 11. So I teach for class 11 on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. And on the remaining three days I teach for class 12. Uh, good afternoon, Surender. So it's good evening again. It's not good afternoon, it's good evening. Um, good evening, Priyanka. Uh, hi, Gopal. Yes. Okay. So today we are going to talk about a very short and a pretty easy chapter. So it's very light. So you can just sit back, relax and look at the pictures. So this lecture is a lot of pictures. So it's just like a movie. You just have to look at the picture, enjoy, analyze, correlate to what I'm talking. And but finally, pay attention to the climax because the climax has a lot of definitions and that is important, right? Okay, so that is all about living well. So it's very easy to correlate because all of us are living organisms, right? Okay, so you're excited for today's class? Okay, so even I am excited for today's class. Okay, so before we go forward to our class, so before we talk about what is the living world, so I have an offer that you can't resist. So it's again a gentle reminder. So you have a coupon code that is KR10. So please download the eCareer Point app and use this code to download or purchase any um, courses or apps. Fine. And mind you, the offer is valid till 30th November only. Fine. So going forward to what is living well, so let's see what is the agenda for today. So today's agenda or what we are going to talk in this living world is basically what is living. So we are going to define what is living. So it's pretty simple, right? So we'll see what living is. Then we are going to talk about the diversity in living organisms, taxonomic categories, taxonomical aids. Okay. Fine, so this, uh, this is our agenda for today. So it's a pretty very short chapter. So not much to remember, but yes, you have certain things to remember. But it's basically a self-study chapter that you can say, or a very light chapter. So when you're really tired, when you can't focus, you can just finish this chapter. It'll just take hardly half an hour time, not even half an hour. So if you're very good at um, concentrating or focusing, very good at focusing or concentrating, just 15 minutes is enough for this chapter. And the weightage is pretty less, okay? So this is your first chapter in class 11. So going forward, I'm just going to show you an array of pictures and you just have to analyze and enjoy these pictures, fine? Because living world is what you know, right? You and I know what is living, but still we're going to define it scientifically and that's what is the talk about today. Okay, so welcome to the living world. So we are going to talk about living organisms. So where do you find living organisms? So I have quite a few pictures, some beautiful pictures, and you can find living organisms in every part of the world, right? Every part of the globe. So first one, so what does it say? So it's a snow leopard, right? So even in snowing conditions, so even in uh, temperatures where it is snowing or in snow mountains, you find living organisms, right? So this is one example. And when you come to forest, you, so you have tropical forest and temperate forest. Again, you have living organisms there, right? When you talk about the ocean, so it's a separate world. So you have an underwater world where you have a huge diversity of living organisms surviving. So again, that is also where living organisms are present. Take a valley, a silent lake might be. Here also you have living organisms thriving, right? So living organisms are everywhere, throughout, in and around. And this is a hot water spring. Of course, even living organisms are present in hot water springs at such high conditions, at high such high temperatures as well. So the temperature here can be around 80 degree to 100 degree. So you have your bacteria surviving here. So all these pictures I have taken to ensure to show you that living organisms are everywhere. So irrespective of the climatic conditions, irrespective of the environment, living organisms thrive. So everywhere you find living organisms, right? So it does not end here. I still have further pictures. <coughs> so this is a galloping horse, right? So this is also living. You have migrating birds, they are also living. Then you have a valley of flowers, just a silent valley of flowers. Even that has living organisms in it, right? So though it's very peaceful, it is again a living world, right? Then a shark, a whale, and finally a dog. So you and I are also living here. So your living organisms are very diverse and it's easily correlatable, right? So now you have an idea about what is living world. So everywhere you have living organisms. Namaste, okay? But how do you define it scientifically? Because it is a chapter that we are going to talk about in um, science, right? So it's a part of your biology chapter. So we can't be talking about something philosophical. So we'll have to bring science here. So how do you define it? So here there is a few lines which says how do you comprehend, how do you understand what is living world? So I read it for you. 
So the ecological conflict and the cooperation among members of a population and among the population of a community or even the molecular traffic inside a cell makes us deeply reflect on what is life in need. So maybe I read it faster, but if you read it much slower, you will understand the essence behind it. So everywhere around you, it's living. In your house, it's not just you, your parents and your siblings living, right? You have other living organisms. You have ants, you have houseflies, you have a lizard probably, you might have a pet cat, you might have a fish tank, you might have birds, right? So you have you have a diversity of living organisms living around you. So looking at everything, you need to reflect on what life is actually. So this is what it says. So it is more of a philosophical definition that is needed, but bringing back science into it. So we are going to talk about what is living. So how do you differentiate between living and non-living? So that is the question for today. Yes. Right. So living things have metabolic process. Yes. So we are going to do, um, talk about the specific features a living beings have and we are going to validate or ensure why it is called living. So when we're talking about the previous chapter, when I was talking to you about the cell, the unit of life, I told you cell is the superhero, right? Sorry. So when I was telling you why the cell is superhero, I give you one slide. I give you definition as to why the cell is unique, right? So that also says your cell has metabolic process. It is capable of so many things, etc., etc. Okay. So we are going to define actually those uh, features here, but with respect to living organisms. Fine. We're not going to talk in detail about the cell, but we're just going to uh, describe living and non-living. How living things are different from non-living things. Okay. So that is all we're going to talk about. So for example, how do you define a living organism? So don't talk cell here. So we're not talking about cell. So in layman terms, if you are living and the chair is not living, how do you define your living? So basically you have growth, you do reproduction, ability to sense the environmental, uh, environment, okay, environmental sickness and mount a suitable response. So all these processes put together makes you a living organism, right? So you're able to perform all these uh, features. So that is why you're called as living. So we'll talk about each of this in detail. Apart from that, you also have metabolism to do. Yes, just like you said, Abhishek, and the ability to self-replicate, self-organize, interact, add it to the list. So these are also makes, uh, uh, features that ensures that an organism is living, right? Fine. Now, first we'll talk about growth. So what is actually growth? All living organisms grow, right? So you increase in height, you increase in weight, all living organisms. So there is increase in mass and number. So this increase in mass and number is a twin feature, right? It goes hand in hand. Fine. In case of unicellular organism, this growth and reproduction, they are mutually exclu uh, inclusive events. They happen simultaneously in case of unicellular organism. Whereas in case of higher plants and animals like us, growth and reproduction are mutually exclusive organism, meaning they are not linked together, right? But still, we all grow, right? Even plants grow. Plants grow throughout their lifetime. Animals grow up to only a certain period. For example, you and I will stop growing after a point of time, right? You don't keep increasing in height. After a point, you don't grow at all, right? So that is growth. So this is about the growth in living organism. But what about in non-living organism? Does non-living organism show growth? Do they show reproduction? So, okay. So, multicellular organisms grow by cell division. Yes, that is what we were talking about in the previous lecture. So, we have been continuously talking about cell cycle and cell division, right? Okay. So, even non-living things grow. When I say even non-living things grow, for example, there is a snow mountain. So, the more the snow gets added, it looks so huge, right? It has increased in mass. It has also increased in height. So, which means it is also growing. So when I define growth, I said it is increase in mass and number, right? So the same thing applies to snow mountain as well. So the more the snow gets added, the huger the mountain becomes. So even that is growing. Then how do I distinguish a living organism and a non-living organism on the basis of growth? So when I say growth, it is defined under that particular condition, okay? So it is the condition under which it observes, it defines whether it is living or non-living. So in case of living organism, growth is intrinsic. Someone from outside does not bring cells and join you, right? You grow within, meaning you have the growth of your, you have the function of your growth hormones, uh, growth factors working inside your body so that you grow. So your growth is intrinsic. Whereas in case of snow mountains, it is extrinsic. So snow from outside gets added. 
sorry so if you have a ball of crystals so more the crystals get added so they're all extrinsic right so your growth is external in case of non living things in case of living things it is intrinsic so that is the difference and when you define growth for a living organism it also matters under what conditions you are defining it fine so this is all about growth so even a plant grows and even a mountain grows so growth can be applicable for both your living and non living things but how it grows and under what condition you are defining it that matters fine so this is all about growth now going forward and talking about the next feature that is reproduction so reproduction is common to uh, living organisms right so is it very are you very sure that reproduction is very distinguishing feature of living organism does all living organism reproduce do all living organisms reproduce of course right so unicellular organisms reproduce higher organisms reproduce so what is the exception so can we blindly say reproduction is the defining factor of living organisms definitely not i will tell you why okay so talking about reproduction it refers to the production of progeny possessing features more or less similar to that of parents so reproduction happens because you have to ensure you have your sustainability of your uh, of your generation right you have to sustain your progeny and hence you reproduce fine so your reproduction can be sexual or asexual in case of organisms like amoeba etc so you have asexual reproduction you have budding etc in case of higher organism it's sexual reproduction you have the fusion of gametes fine so this is in case of yeast so it uh, divides with the help of budding so that is how it reproduces okay so this is uh, planaria so it reproduces with the help of fragmentation so each part of the body is fragmented and each new fragment develops into a new organism fine but how can you say reproduction is not the defining property there are some living organisms which cannot reproduce can you think of something for example mules right mules are infertile they are sterile right they cannot reproduce for example you have worker bees male bees which cannot reproduce you have sterile uh, human couples as well who cannot reproduce so you cannot say reproduction is exactly the defining feature of living organisms yes okay but it is not even a linked uh, it is not even a linked uh, um, event along with growth as well so you can say reproduce but no non living organism can reproduce right so that is also one criteria so though not all living organisms can reproduce at the same time no non living objects can reproduce you can count reproduction as one of the defining properties but it is not the only defining property of a living organism fine is this understood so this is about reproduction so now going further and talking about the next feature so your next feature is metabolism yes like abhishek was saying so what is metabolism so all living organisms are made of chemicals you agree so your body and my body currently has a lot of chemicals hundreds and thousands of chemicals are right there in your body your hormones your metabolites everything is a chemical your amino acids everything right so we are made up of chemicals so many re reactions are happening so if you had any uh, if you had late lunch or if you had tea or coffee right now your digestive system and my digestive system are working right so a lot of pancreatic enzymes juices etc everything is being produced so everything is chemical so all living organisms we are made of chemicals so chemicals these chemicals can be big small they can belong to various classes they might have various functions they are not all the same right so the sum total of all chemical reactions that is occurring in your body is called metabolism so metabolism is a very very important factor when you talk about a living organism so the better the metabolism the better the human being right so this all chemical reactions meaning all cellular process that is happening inside your body is metabolism fine so can you now say metabolism is a defining feature of a living organism because non living uh, uh, objects do not have metabolism right say so they do not have reactions going on within them so the chair that you're sitting in or maybe the couch that you're sitting in does not have a metabolic reaction going on right now but at the same time you and i have metabolic reaction happening in our body right so can you say metabolism is one of the defining feature of a living organism but there's a small trick okay you can say cellular organization of the body is the defining feature of life form it is because of your cell that metabolism is possible right so without cell metabolism is not possible so you can say the cellular organization is one of the defining feature but there's a short twist to it so the catch is for example if your body is able to synthesize cholesterol 
I put the same ingredients in a test tube and that will also give me cholesterol, right? So the end product is the same, the same reaction is happening. I can do the same reaction in a test tube. So can I call, again, metabolism is not a defining feature, right? Am I right? So if I do the same reaction in a test tube that is in vitro, I get the same end product. So that is what you do in your labs, right? Chemistry labs. So you add two things and get your end product. So the same thing is happening in your body. So I am able to create the living reactions in, in vitro. So can I say metabolism is again a defining feature? This is metabolism happening in your body. This is metabolism happening in case of bacteria. This is feroxidants, okay? And you also have reactions happening in vitro. So those, these reaction happens in a test tube that is in vitro, they are living reactions. They also happen simultaneously inside your body. So they are categorized as living reaction. Hence you can say metabolism is also one of the defining features of life forms on earth. Fine? Okay. So going to the next property or the next feature, it is ability to sense. So all living organisms can sense, right? So you can sense when it's hot, when it's cold. So when it's pretty cold, you turn off the AC if the air condition is on. And when it's, when, it's hot, when it's really hot, you turn on the fan, air condition, everything, right? So you are able to sense the environment. You know when it's raining, you know when it's snowing. So you can identify the uh, intensity of heat and light around you, yes? So the ability to sense the surrounding environment and respond to these environmental stimuli, okay? It can either be physical, chemical or biological, right? So all this is one of the unique property only a living organism possesses. So if you burn a chair, your chair is not going to sense it, right? It will just burn along. So, but as living organisms, we can feel the surrounding, you can respond to the stimulus. So this is one of the best or the only defining feature that is the ability to sense between a living organism and a non-living organism. Fine? So we are also self-conscious, right? So if you look at a particular scene in the environment, you're able to correlate it inside your mind, you're able to process the information. So that's just called as being self-conscious. So consciousness is definitely a defining property of living organisms only. Fine? Yes? So now also all of us are conscious, right? So we are conscious about what is happening at home. So no one is actually completely 100% focused, right? So we are always looking around what is happening around us. We are also looking at the notification that's coming in your phone right now, right? So it happens. Okay. Now, coming to the topic that is diversity in living world. So, so far we have been defining what is living and what are the properties of the defining features of a living organism. Now, there are a lot of living organisms, right? Just like I told you in your house, it's not only human beings living. You also have other organisms. Right now in your hand and my hand will have a lot of bacteria. So, you also have microorganisms in your house. You have microorganisms within you. So, you have a diversity of living organisms, right? Just in your house. So your house is a small place and you have a diversity of living organisms. Then imagine the world. Imagine the amount of species that are present. So till today, a lot of species are unknown to us. We, are not, we have not yet discovered the nature fully, right? So a lot of uh, species, plants, animals, microorganisms are still undiscovered. They are yet to be discovered. So this diversity of living organism is very important because you have a lot of species. So this diversity or the variety among living organisms is called as biodiversity, okay? Okay, so, okay, fine. So, so there are so many living organisms, but you need to identify them. So throughout the world, you need to have a standard name. Just like you are given a name when you're born, right? <coughs> Excuse me for my coughs. So you are given a name when you are born, right? So you are known by that name. You are known by that identity throughout your life. So similarly, you have so many living organisms around you. And there was a need to simplify and have a stable and internationally accepted name for everyone, right? So that was first thing that came to our mind, at least to the scientist's mind, that you need to classify them, you need to name them. So how will you know this is E. coli? How will you know this is dog? You need to name them. So that naming process was called as nomenclature, fine? So how does you, how do you name a particular object? So how do you name a particular microorganism? First you identify, first you characterize, okay, so whether they are, uh, living 
whether they are unicellular or multicellular then you characterize them okay you identify you characterize then you name and then you classify right so there are certain procedures that you follow when you do nomenclature so nomenclature is the naming thing so naming is fine and then you have to classify how do you know these are gram positive bacteria these are gram negative bacteria you have so many classifications right so as you go narrower into a particular aspect or a field you have more narrower classification right so broadly we say eukaryotes and prokaryotes but within them how many classifications you have within prokaryotes you have eubacteria archaebacteria and within them you can go more, more further right gram positive gram negative so that entire need was to simplify and stably and also to be internationally accepted for example if there is a neem tree it is known as neem tree throughout the world right so we have uh, common names for example in south they have a different name according to the language in north they have a different name but scientifically internationally the name has to be accepted right yes by icbn yes we'll talk about that so organism has to be correctly described so that process of describing an organism is called identification fine okay so who names them who identifies them who gives the nomenclature it is icbn Yes, you're right, Abhishek. So it is ICBN stands for International Code for Botanical Nomenclature. So botanical stands for plants. So all your plant species they are named by your ICBN. So the nomenclature is given by ICBN. Similarly, you have ICZN. It's International Code for Zoological Nomenclature. So this is basically for your fauna. Okay. So here there's a rule as to how you write the scientific name of an organism. right so there are two components of a name of a scientific name of a plant or an animal okay of any microorganism as well so e coli so what does e stands for escherichia coli right so everything has two name so it has two components the first part is called as the generic name and the second part is called as the species name okay so this system of providing a name with two components since you have two components it is called as binomial nomenclature by is two So you have two components, hence it is called as binomial nomenclature. Fine. So one example is Magnifera indica. Yes, the same example I have Abhishek. Okay. But to write this name, you have certain rules because it has to be internationally accepted, right? Yes. So E. coli E stands for Escherichia. Okay. So there are some rules that has to be followed. So let's look at what are the rules. Okay. So the first one is the biological names are generally in Latin. okay so they are not of indian origin they are of latin origin and it is written in italics so they are italicized or derived from latin irrespective of their origin fine so the first word in the biological name represents the genus as to which genus it belongs yes abhishek uh, and the second name denotes the species epithet or the specific epithet okay so both the words in a biological name when handwritten it has to be underlined separately okay when you are printing it it has to be italicized so these are the rules that has to be followed it is followed even now in the scientific community okay so the first word denoting the genus it starts with a capital letter while the second name starts with a small letter so magnifera indica this talks about your mango okay so magnifera is common to all the mango trees but you have so many varieties of mango is in india right so one of them is indica <laughs> So Magnifera is a generic name, and Indica is your specific epithet. So Magnifera M M is capitalized, and Indica has to be in small. And when it is not printed, when it is handwritten, it has to be underlined separately. Fine. These are the rules that you follow when you write a scientific name. So scientific names are present for your animals, your microorganisms, etc. So we human beings fall on the category of Homo sapiens, right? So that is also a binomial nomenclature. fine so going forward there's another term that i want to introduce and that is called taxonomy so have you heard about what is taxonomy okay so let's define taxonomy but before that scientific term for the categories is called taxa so first we have uh, characterized it we have identified it and we have named it so nomenclature is done so once you have named it you need to classify them right So, for example, in your school also they classify you according to your height, your age, etc. Now we are going to classify. So that classification is called as taxonomy. We are going to classify them as plant kingdom, animal kingdom. Uh, you it can be prokaryotes, eukaryotes, etc. So that classification is called as taxonomy. And in classification, so you have various levels, right? So each level is called as a taxa. Fine. So the process of classification is called taxonomy. 
okay so on what basis do you classify so that is more important so that criteria is pretty important so you classify them based on the external and the internal structure so externally for example all um, animal kingdom they have a tail okay an internal structure as to how their cell is designed how is the architecture of the cell whether they are unicellular multicellular do they have division of labor do they have tissues organs organ system so that also matters so along with the structure of the cell the developmental process so the developmental process is not the same in all living organisms right so our developmental process is different in case of dogs it is different right so that is also taken into account and the ecological information of the organisms are essential so what do you mean by the ecological information their habitat their adaptations all that is also important for us so based on all these features you classify them okay i have another term so i have 33 terms first is nomenclature second is taxonomy and the third one is systematics so what is systematics so systematics is a branch of taxonomy that talks about your ancestral relationship that is your phylogeny so how are we interconnected so how are we connected with monkeys so we know mon apes and monkeys are our ancestors so we are talking about the linkage so who is the common ancestor so that relationship gives us what is systematics fine so now your entire living organism is divided into these many taxa okay so your broad term is kingdom so this is broad so it becomes narrow so it has so many uh, 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 what to say it has so many differences so as you go down it has more similarities fine so kingdom phylum or division class order family genus and species fine so when you come from here it is the descending order when you go from down to up it is the ascending order fine so we are going to talk about each of them in detail okay so for example you say uh, class 1 then you say class 1 to 5 comes under primary then you say they come under students okay then you say teenagers then you say college right so you have a broader classification right so th similarly that's how we are going to classify here so we'll talk about each of them with a particular example it is not tough so you'll understand when you look at the examples fine <coughs> first is species so they are the lowest or the fundamental unit of your classification okay so a group of individual organisms with fundamental similarities so basically they are morphologically similar so you call them as species okay so human beings belong to the species sapiens they are grouped in the genus homo so the first name stands for your gene uh, uh, generic name right and the second name is your species name so homo sapiens so sapiens is a species so basically species inbreed among themselves so hi ronit okay fine so we uh, species inbred among themselves so they are group of individuals with a lot of similarities fine so that is homo sapiens so again note how i have written the name so it is italicized here h is uh, capital and s is small fine so that is how you write okay so the next one is genus so a group of similar species makes up genus okay so it comprises of a group of related species so species was the uh, least term so there you have similar organisms um, basically morphological similar and a group of uh, related uh, species they come together to form what is genus and they have more characteristics in common compared to your species okay for example look at this look at this lion leopard and tiger they all belong to the same genus but different species okay so they have several common features thus they all belong they all belong to a different species right so your lion is different your leopard is different you know you call that's why you have named them differently lion leopard tiger but ultimately they all have some common features and thus they have come under the same genera so the genera here is panthera so panthera is your generic name leo is your species name so panthera leo is your lion Pantheria paratus is your leopard and Pantheria tigris is your tiger, right? So this is what I want to talk about genus, okay? So now you understood? Yes. Now going to family. So a much broader term, okay? So a group of related genera will give you families, okay? So we are going up. So the number of similarity will reduce, okay? Your differences will be more here. So it is based on vegetative and reproductive species, uh, reproductive features of a plant. Okay, so you say family, 
again i have an example so genus panthera comprises of lion tiger leopard fine okay so that is what we saw before now it is put along with the genus that is felis so we all know they are under the cat family right so we say cat family so anything that has whiskers is called a cat family right so though they are of different genus they are coming under the same family that is cat family right so that is how family is made so they all come under the family felidae so you call them as cat family okay thank you abhishek so as long as you understand i am happy okay so this is the entire cat family though you have different genera and furthermore you have different species here okay next another broader term that is order so now we know based on the number of similar characters but still it is a broader term fine so though cats belong to cat family that is felidae and dogs belong to canine family but still they come under a broad term called carnivorous right so both are carnivorous your dogs are also carnivorous your cats are also carnivorous right but they come together under the same uh, order that is carnivorous fine so now you understand what is order it is a much broader term fine okay the next one is your class again a group of related orders will give you class fine for example order primates fine so we are talking about order so primates will have anything with a vertebral column so you have monkey gorilla gibbon fine they are placed together with class mammalia your order primates so order comes first and above them comes class so you are grouping two related orders so one order is your primates the other order is your carnivores fine tiger cats and dogs but all these your primates and your carnivores everyone are mammals right so you group them under a much broader term that is class mammalia fine you understand so order primates have monkey gorilla and gibbon order carnivores have cat dogs and tigers but put together they all come under a broader class that is mammals fine so that is how you classify them okay so this is your order primates and this is carnivores now a much broader term that is phylum so phylum and division there are two things so phylum and division are equivalent terms so phylum is in case of animals and division is in case of plants fine so classes comprising animals like fish amphibians reptiles birds so you are basically uniting similar classes together here okay so one class like fishes amphibians reptiles birds you group them with another class that is mammals okay so now they all come together under one phylum so they come under phylum chordata okay so a group of a similar class they fall uh, they form what is your phylum fine so all of them have your vertebral column so there's something like the dorsal hollow neural system so they come under phylum chordata okay so the finally broad term so uh, you can just take the example of a king so king will have ministers ministers will have merchants then below them you have uh, low caste people working right so that is how you divide in case of a normal kingdom similarly again it's a kingdom here so here it's a much broader term it houses everyone together a group of species a group of genera then a group of family class order etc right so all animals belonging to various phyla so you are basically uniting a lot of phyla here so they are assigned to the highest taxa that is your kingdom so we call kingdom animalia so under uh, kingdom animalia you have phylum chordata then you have class uh, mammalia then you have order then you have family etc etc right so this is the highest taxonomy classification present fine so did you understand the various taxonomies how it is classified okay fine so when you talk about living world the questions will come from your um, tax uh, taxonomy like this belongs to this kingdom this belongs to this phylum so match it so which comes before what so basically questions comes from that part so that is important okay uh, good evening kriti ma'am okay so now i have the last thing so this is your climax so you need to pay attention to your climax because this has a lot of definitions so as the name says taxonomical aids so a aid is nothing but help right so there are certain tools uh, there are certain things which help in your classification so what are those which help in classification so we are going to look at those tools the first one is called herbarium okay so what is a herbarium 
Okay, first let's look at what are the taxonomical aids present and then we'll talk about each of them in detail. Okay, the second one is botanical gardens. So botanical gardens, I think all of you would have visited. So it has a variety of plants, right? So many diverse variety of plants. So looking, so you have a plant there. So physically you can look at the features of a plant and then you can classify them. So they help in the classification. So they're basically called as your taxonomical aids. Fine. So next is museum, zoological parks. And finally, it is a key. So we'll talk about each of them in detail. Okay. So the first one is a herbarium. So it is basically a storehouse of collected plant specimen that are dried, pressed and preserved on sheet. So you take a particular leaf sample, you dehydrate it and you paste it on a piece of paper. Okay. And then you preserve it for years. So you label it, you write the name and you preserve it for the future generations to know. So that kind of taxonomical aid is called as herbarium fine then you have botanical gardens so just now i spoke about botanical gardens it is collection of living plants for your references so have you ever been to a botanical garden so there are a lot of botanical gardens around india so please visit you have one in lucknow um, one in kolkata one in coimbatore okay so botanical gardens are really peaceful so anyways plants are good for a uh, good for for you okay so when you're surrounded by plants you feel more peaceful right so botanical gardens are really a very very serene place okay so just go and look at the amount of variety that is present so not that in one botanical garden you will have all varieties but i can ensure you the botanical garden in Coimbatore does not house the same plants that is present in lucknow so that diverse that is okay so there are botanical gardens outside india also okay Okay, so museums, talking about museums, so it's a collection of preserved plant and animal specimens for study and reference. So all of us would have been to museums, right? So you'd have seen the uh, kind of um, uh, animals, so basically the skull, the bones of the ancient animals that were living. So that is museums, okay? So this is how your herbarium is. So you basically preserve plants, okay? This is your botanical garden and this is your museum. So you would have seen something like this in your Jurassic Park, right? So even now some museums have the skeleton of dinosaurs, okay? Fine. Zoological parks, so all of you would have been to zoo. So you actually uh, maintain or you let animals live under the human care. You create, uh, you mimic the natural conditions for an animal, but they are under a human care. So why do you keep them under human care? So that you can study more about them. You can learn about their food habits, their behavior, etc. So for example, panda. So panda is one trending example, right? A panda gets moved off if you don't talk to it. If it's left alone, it gets depressed. So there has to be someone who has to play with the panda. So panda are almost endangered species, right? So to preserve them. So now we are uh, making, uh, mimicking the natural environment. Okay, fine. So this is about zoological parks. Okay, finally, one of your taxonomical aid is your keys. So what are keys? So it is used for the identification of plants and animals based on similarities and dissimilarities, okay? For example, when I say two plants are similar, it does not mean they are identical, right? If I say they are exactly identical means they are clones, they are, they are siblings. But if I say two different plants, they might have a lot of similarities, yet they might have differences, right? So that is a key. Okay, so it is based on contrasting characters generally in a pair. So key is basically a statement. So it has a pair of statements. So one statement contradicts the other. One statement is the opposite of the other. Since it comes in a pair, so you call it as a couplet. Okay, so each statement in a key. So I told you there are two statements. So one particular statement is called as a lead. So you need to remember this term. What is a key? What is a couplet? What is a lead? Fine. Is this understood? So apart from these taxonomical A's, you also have four others. You have what is called as flora, manuals, monographs, and catalogs. So flora is nothing but a book. It consists of a list of plants present in a particular species. But it will also consist of only the habitat and a mild description of the plant. So flora is basically plants, okay? So how flora aids in your taxonomy is that it is a book. It consists of only the indexing of the plants present in a particular area. Okay, manuals, manuals are books that contains detailed description of plants present in a particular area. Okay, so if you are a botanist and if you want to find a particular collection of a plant, okay, so nowadays you go for uh, Ayurvedic medicines, right? 
so you go for ayurvedic cosmetics also so you are in need of a particular plant so how will you find the information you go for these taxonomical aids okay then monographs so monographs contain information about one particular taxa okay then finally catalogs so catalogs also contain information about a particular species of that area okay is that understood so this is all about living well so it was a very light chapter you just had to sit back and listen to what i'm talking and i as i told you the climax is uh, where you have to pay attention because you had a lot of definition fine so i hope the living world was clear okay it was a very simple and easy chapter um, to listen on a evening time right so when is my next session so my next session is tomorrow so every day at 4 pm i am live but on three days i teach for class 12 and another three days i teach for class 11 So I repeat for Monday, Wednesday, and Friday I teach class twelve. So tomorrow a uh, uh, topic will be uh, Mendelian disorders, basically genetic disorders. So we were talking about genetics in class twelve. So I will continue on that. Okay. Again, on Saturday we'll meet with class eleven. Okay. So if you really like my lecture, if you really understood something out of it, so please subscribe, like, and share. Fine. So I will meet you tomorrow. So until then, have a very nice evening and have a great day ahead. but hoping to meet you all tomorrow fine until then bye and thank you